Hi, Alicia here. Welcome to my channel. Today, we're going to be talking about the best books that I read in 2019. <laughs> Yo! Welcome back. I hope you are all doing well, staying safe, and staying home in this pandemic that we're all a part of. I thought I would bring you a list of the books that I read last year that I really enjoyed. These are books that all either received high fours or five stars. I've got a good range of genres spanning from nonfiction, fantasy, science fiction, contemporary, and of course horror. I'm hoping that you might be able to find these books on audio or ebook if you are interested in reading them from the safety and security of your own home. So without uh, further ado, let's get into those books. The first book I'd like to talk about is a non-fiction memoir slash essay collection called Mind Spread Down on the Ground by Haudenosaunee writer Alicia Elliott. This is a condemning and searing, but also aspirational collection of essays all about the horror and continued legacy of colonialism in quote unquote Canada. Each chapter in this collection covers an incredibly complex issue with just the most exceptional writing and detail, ranging from poverty, mental illness, interge intergenerational trauma, abuse, um, surrounding Indigenous peoples in Canada. It was definitely a difficult read, but also was really accessible. Pretty much required reading for white settlers in not just Canada, but any colonized nation. Alicia Elliott has an incredibly powerful voice, not just in her essays and her nonfiction, but also online as well. I encourage you to check her out. The next book I'd like to talk about is the charming, wonderful, and strange Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata. This is a Japanese contemporary fiction story that was pretty much just ASMR the book. This follows 36 year old Keiko living in Japan. She is uh, happily working in a convenience store, which she has been doing since she was 18 years old. She got the job uh, when she was when she started going to university and then has just been in this convenience store ever since. She is happy to be here. She loves what she's doing. She loves the process and order of this job. And it's just what she wants to be doing. And this book is mostly a social commentary of what it means to be like aspirational in society. There is this like underlying suggestion that Keiko might be on the autism spectrum, but that's not a central part of the story. She's just doing something that she loves and it's the pressures of her family and the people around her who want her to be, you know, climbing that social ladder, doing more with her life and her just refusing to bend to the will of others. There's also a really weird subplot in this where there's like a definite incel who works at the convenience store with her and he's like trying to take advantage of her and that was like really gross and creepy but this book was funny uh, Keiko was just so charming and this it just makes you feel good like if you're looking for something that's definitely a little bit strange but it's just gonna make you like smile like the joke baby then uh check out convenience store woman Next, I've got a couple of fantasies that I would like to talk about. The first of which is Circe by Madeline Miller. And before we actually talk about the book, I would just like to talk about this beautiful edition. Uh, this book came out in 2018 and I bought it when I was in Ireland. And just the naked hardback is just absolutely beautiful. It is just a 
stunning edition of this book. I'm not normally somebody who cares about the physical condition or edition of a book. I just kind of lucked out when I bought this and it was she's a beauty. Anyways, um, this is the second book I have read by Madeline Miller. The first one was Song of Achilles, which is a retelling of the Battle at Troy, and it is a queer romance, and it is so wonderful. It made me cry for a day. Uh, Circe is another mythology retelling, recreation, reimagining. This is about the witch Circe, who is basically only a footnote in the Odyssey, like Homer's Odyssey. And Madeline Miller creates an entirely like rich backstory all about Circe living on this island, being an incredibly powerful witch. It was it was romantic, it was fun, there were monsters, like you're not even gonna give a fuck about home, like the Odyssey, like Odysseus, who who dat, when you um, check out to Circe. There was so much to love about this. It was the very first book I read in uh, 2019 and it started the year off on the right foot. Highly recommend. Next, I would like to talk about my boy, China Nieville. This year, I read The Scar, which is the second book in the Boz Log universe that China Nieville wrote. I believe China Nieville categorizes his own fiction as weird fantasy, like that's what he calls it. It's also very uh, steampunk. I think is uh, I think he's like one of the unofficial fathers of steampunk. Steampunk, fantasy, science fiction, horror, all wrapped up into one genre of weird, weird fiction. The Scar is uh, the second book. The first one is Perdido Street Station in the Boslog series. I read Perdido Street Station uh, three or four years ago. This is still one of the most affecting books I have ever read. This book still keeps me up at night, making me feel a certain kind of way. This, if you want a fantasy that's just gonna break you right up, making you feel some kind of way, read Perdido Street Station. I still am, I still got issues. Like good, like good, I'm still like turnt, turnt around, twisted up because of Perdido Street Station. Anyways, we're not here to talk about Perdido Street Station. We're here to talk about The Scar. So The Scar is, so in like the Boz Log series, they aren't connected in that like, you have to read them one after the other, like the plots aren't connected, but they all take place in the same world. That being said, I do think you should read Perdido Street Station first because it, it, helps, it helps you like develop the world a bit more. Anyways. Uh, Boslog is just like this giant fantasy world that is kind of a mix of like, it's steampunk. It's like a mix of past and present technologies. It's very like industrial. And the Scar follows a woman, she's like a linguist named Bellis Coldwine, and she is going on a ship leaving the main city in Boslog, like one of the most populous cities called New Crabazon. And New Crabazon is like a giant skeleton thing. <laughs> Anyways, she's leaving the town into the ocean. And then it's just kind of like the whole plot is kind of set on this ship. And then there's just so much else going on. It's there's a lot of world development that happens in Perdido Street Station. So I can't really say too much about this one without giving it away. This book has some central characters in it that are the remade, which are talked about in Pretty Do Street Station, but one of the actual central characters in this book named Tanner Sack is a remade. And the remade are just some of the coolest, but also grossest um, character types ever. They are probably well, no, they could have started out as any race. Like there are multiple races. There's like Kepri, which are like bug people. There are Garu Garuda, Garuda, which are bird people. 
and there are humans. And then Remade are, they are basically humans that are pretty much the victim of the criminal justice system. Like if you get arrested for whatever, you could like have stolen bread. And then when you are in jail, they could decide your, that your punishment is to become remade. So like if you stole bread with your hands, for example, they could cut off your hands and then turn your hands into mechanical claws. So you're basically like your body is, is basically becomes changed. Like I think there's a woman in this uh, who her legs have been like replaced with like tank wheels. So it's, it's always ghastly what happens um, to the people when they become remade. And it's always a punishment. Like it's meant to be like some sort of, hey, karma, you did this, so then now you get this. Uh, anyways, Tanner is one of the staff on this ship and he is a remade and it's rad. Uh, his plots are always vast and humongous with so much build up and I absolutely loved this and I love him and I just love everything that he writes so if you're interested in like an epic fantasy with like weird sometimes really gross um, and like steampunk elements check out China Mieville don't start with Scar start with Pretty Doe Street Station. Please and thanks. Welcome to my TED Talk. The last fantasy that I would like to talk about is Kings of the Wild by Nicholas Eames. This was a debut book by this author and it is 100% a love letter to the fantasy genre. Definitely a person who played D&D for, for show. Kings of the Wild is Definitely like an adventure fantasy, but it is also very funny and sarcastic and uses a lot of like conventional fantasy tropes. It's following a group of legendary mercenaries. When they, when they were in their prime, they were like the greatest band of adventurers in all of the land. Everybody knows who they were. Songs are written about these five men. But now, fast forward to the present, they are all old, retired, fat, drunk, missing. They are just, they're retired. They're done. However, uh, issue strikes and one of the, and the band leader's daughter uh, goes missing. So the gang got to get back together to do one final quest. They go out in their retired years, they gotta, first they gotta get the gang back together, they gotta assemble, and then they gotta go on this final quest where living is not necessarily guaranteed. This was funny, it was heartwarming, it made me cry two times, it was just so good. If you wanna read about some old, retired mercenaries, getting back into their shorts and going out on a quest to go save their daughter, check out Kings of the Wild. Um, one of the band members is a gay wizard named Moog, and I love that. I You don't get a lot of queer representation in fantasy books, and Moog, I just want to read the book all about Moog. Loved him. Loved this. Do read this for some fun. Next, I've got a couple of science fiction books that I would like to share with you, starting with science fiction classic Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes. I have had this book on my shelf for years. This is one of the oldest books that I had on my shelf. I was sleeping on it. I'm mad about it because when I read it, this book rocked my actual world. Flowers for Algernon follows Charlie Gordon, who is a janitor living his best life. He was born with an extremely low IQ, but he's not mad about it. He's just living, living how he can. He works, he's, he's like a delivery man, works as a janitor. People treat him right and he's living his best life. But he is, um, because he has an extremely low IQ, he was selected by a 
experimental research facility to be part of a research research study with the goal of boosting his IQ. And he, I believe, is the first human test subject. It had been tested exclusively on animals up until Charlie when they started seeing some success. The um, little mouse on the cover here, is, or I think he's a rat. No, he's a mouse. Algernon is a mouse. So um, Algernon is the last animal subject prior to Charlie taking the test. So they're both kind of in the facility at the same time. The exceptional thing about this book is that it's written in the form of journal entries. So it starts with Charlie writing his journal entries before he has had any sort of um, experimental drugs or process put upon him and it follows him as his IQ begins to raise. So the grammar and the punctuation and the spelling are all changing as Charlie's IQ raises. So this was just must have been a labor of love for Daniel Keyes to write because like you'll just you're just kind of like naturally noticing spelling errors become fixed punctuation like isn't even a thing in the first quarter of this book but as Charlie becomes more woke and self-aware his uh, grammar and spelling changes so this is definitely one that you have to read the physical copy of yeah, so as Charlie, be, his IQ raises, he becomes more intelligent and more self-aware to the point that he's actually smarter than the scientists who are doing these tests on him. And it is just one of the most heartbreaking books I have ever read. I, I finished this book, had a little think, had a, a bit of a cry, and just logged this on the shelf of like best books I've ever read in my life. This is a classic for a reason and I just strongly advocate for it to be read. Uh, read Flower for Algernon, read the physical book. It is as good as everybody says it is. The next science fiction book on my best of 2019 list is Obscura by Joe Hart. I would categorize Obscura as like a science fiction horror probably. Uh, psychological horror for sure. Obscura follows Dr. Jillian Ryan who is a research scientist who is kind of like the leading researcher on this new form of dementia that has been plaguing the world. So this dementia is not it does not distinguish based on age so even people even children could catch this form of dementia that they don't know how it spreads they don't know why it spreads they don't know how people get it they don't know if it's hereditary they don't know what it's just like a brand new dementia that will make you slowly forget everything until you die and Dr. Jillian Ryan, I believe, lost her husband and her daughter. Oh no, so she lost her husband and her daughter has it. So she's, she's on it. She's got to figure what, out what the heck is causing this so that she can develop a cure. Meanwhile, she's, so she's doing her research. Her prime goal is saving her daughter. And then she gets called by one of her colleagues because there is a space station uh, orbiting the Earth that has uh, scientists on it that are all kind of catching this dementia. So she is asked on a favor to go out to this space station to see what's going on with the people on this ship. So she agrees, but nobody actually knows that Jillian is dealing with uh, addiction. She is addicted to opioids. She keeps it a secret. So she's just like, okay, good as time as any to quit cold turkey while I'm taking this three month journey to this space station. Oh, what could go wrong? So this is psychologically terrifying um, following Jillian stuck on this ship that's going out to the station. She is awake. She is alone. She is going through withdrawals. This was a 
really spooky psychological horror all about addiction, dementia, loss, and spooky shit in space. The next science fiction that I read in 2019 that I would like to recommend is The Gone World by Tom Sweaterlich. The Gone World is has one of the most aggressively original plots I have ever read in my life. This book follows Shannon Moss, who is a secret agent, a secret government agent in the year 1997. And her job is hunting murderers and kidnappers and serial killers. She's an investigator. And the way that she does this is by traveling into different possible versions of the future in order to find possible evidence that she can then bring back to the present to support her case. So in this scenario, you can only travel forwards into the future. And then even then, when you are traveling forward, you it isn't the actual guaranteed timeline that you're traveling forward into. So you've got like this linear past, present, and then the second you jump into the future, you could be going like any one of a million possible ways. So she basically just like travels to different points in the future, trying to find evidence for a specific case that might support her coming back into the present and then investigating it further there. It was very original, very fun, very quick, very complicated read, The Gone World. The last uh, science fiction book that I would like to talk about is Severance by Ling Ma. This probably was the best book that I read in 2019, but I don't actually know if I should be recommending it to anybody to read now because Severance follows a woman named Candace Chen in like a dual before and after timeline about living through a pandemic. <laughs> ah! It was, it's definitely like a satire dystopian book and it is amazing and it was really unsettling. And now that we are living in a pandemic, it might be too on the nose, I think. But it was one of the most exceptional books I read last year. So plot-wise, Severance follows Candace Chen, who is first-generation Chinese-American. She is working in Manhattan in like a publishing house where her job is binding or creating Bibles for teens. So she's basically just like this monotonous process of making Bibles, Bibles one after the other, and that's like the only book that she publishes as in her role. And this virus called Shen Fever is like sweeping the world. And Shen Fever is basically, if you catch it, you slowly just start to do the basic routine or like a basic routine that you do in your life over and over and over again until you die. So for some people, it's like that you, you might not even notice for a long time that they have Shen fever because their lives are so routine anyway. So it's definitely like a satire in that regard. So like if your job involved going to the same office every day, doing the exact same set of tasks, going home, eating dinner, and going to bed, Shen fever would just kind of affect you that way. You'd keep going into the office, but you might not like be as animated or like talking to a pe two two people as much but you just like do the same routine and then the routine would get smaller and smaller and smaller until you're just like repeating the same task so you might like if you were a stay-at-home mom your routine might just like devolve into just like setting the table over and over and over again and you're like stuck in this loop until you aren't nourishing yourself and you die so it's basically kind of a a different version of a zombie a, a, a epic pandemic if you will because you aren't eating anybody but you are just doing the monotony of your life until you die from it anyways so candace is the skeleton crew in her publishing house so she's it's basically following her as she is this single soul person navigating through manhattan which is probably 
very much a real thing happening right now and it's following her as the pandemic kind of comes to Manhattan and then goes back and forth in time like pre-pandemic and then also with the people that she meets during the pandemic. Ma's writing was amazing like I would read anything that she wrote this book was funny it scared me a lot I think if I read it now it would give me a panic attack and I would die so I'm not necessarily re I'm recommending to read this in a different time or if you have already read it let's talk about it uh, let's talk about how messed up that is uh, anyways severance Ling Ma probably best book I read last year don't think I'll ever read it again. Ah. Next, I've got a couple of horror books that made my top list naturally that I would like to tell you about. The first one is called Mind of Winter by Laura Kashiki. This I would probably call a contemporary horror and this is wild. Mind of Winter wild. So Mind of Winter takes place all in one day on Christmas Day and it's following a mother, Holly. It's all stream of consciousness, first person stream of consciousness and she's talking and she's basically reflecting on 13 years prior when they adopted their daughter Tatiana or Tati from Russia. And it's kind of got this like repetitive line throughout the book that's like something followed us home from Russia and Holly is just kind of reflecting on Christmas Day how something isn't quite right with Tati and you've got that repetitive like something followed us home from Russia. So is what's going on? Who? What's going on with Tati? Is Tati possessed? Like something something weird's going on. Is Holly going weird because you're in her mind? Like this book definitely explores an unreliable narrator which is like when done well is a plot that I really really like. There is the twist of this book. I I actually threw the book across the room. It scared me so much. So this book has a twist that shook me to my actual bones. My bones hurt after I finished this book. I just laid there with the book on the other side of the house and was just like, Ugh. So I don't really want to say much more. Mind of Winter. All in one day, stream of consciousness, first person point of view, unreliable narrator, rockin' heckin' good twist. Check it out. The next horror book that I would like to recommend is Kill Creek by Scott Thomas. This was a really fun haunted house style horror. So Kill Creek follows four renowned horror writers who are kind of being brought into this mansion, this Kill Creek house for a publicity stunt. So you've got like these four definite like horror archetypes. So Sam Garver is the main character. I believe his name is Sam Garver. Um, Sam Mick. Sam McGarver. He is probably like your current like Joe Hill style horror author. He was like really famous. He's written some amazing books and he's just like got in a slump right now and hasn't published a book for a while. One of the other authors in this book is he is a uh, he writes horror for like tweens so he's basically like your R.L. Stein kind of writer. There's a woman who writes really like visceral erotic and like murder horror. She's like, it's very, she's very, like, her work is very, like, violent. And then the final um, author in this house is, he's basically like your, like, Lovecraftian, like, OG, like, cosmic horror. And then, like, nobody ever really sees this guy. He keeps, he keeps to himself. So it's these four horror authors who've never really met themselves, but they're all, like, big in the, in the world of writing horror. And they get brought into this house for a publicity stunt to spend the night and do a 24-hour interview in this house 
that is set to be haunted. So they're all kind of interested in this idea because it'll help them get publicity for different reasons. But little did they know, is the house actually haunted? Bleah! There's definitely some gore, there's definitely some haunted house, and yeah, this isn't like a book that's gonna like change your life. No, it's not that. It's just like a fun, gritty, gruesome horror movie that follow horror book that follows some cool, interesting characters. The next horror that I would like to recommend is another one that I took out of my library last year called The Devil Crept In by Anya Alborn. This was the first book that I read by her and I am now like d dead set on reading everything that Anya Alborn has ever written. The Devil Crept In follows one of my favorite horror tropes. It is about a 10 year old boy named Stevie who is lives in Oregon with his family and his 13-year-old cousin Jude, who lives in the town with them, goes missing. And no one is really like that concerned that Jude has gone missing because I feel like Jude is like kind of a rascally piece of shit who uh, it's not unlikely for him to just kind of go out and do his own thing. But Stevie is just convinced that something has happened to Jude and takes it upon himself to investigate Jude's disappearance. So this again is like child versus evil in, in a sense. It's first person from Stevie's point of view. And then Jude eventually does come back to the town. So everybody's like, what were you worried about? Here, here Jude is. But Stevie knows that something is wrong with Jude. Like the Jude that went away is not the Jude that came back. So even with Jude uh, having reappeared in town, Stevie's still like, no, gotta figure it out. So this uh, book is like uh, in the perspective of Stevie investigating his cousin and then it also switches to a completely separate storyline and you just kind of kind of figure out as the book goes along how these uh, stories and plots weave together. There's a lot of gore and like gruesome horror going on here. There are trigger warnings for child abuse for sure. But I really enjoyed this. It was a lot of fun. It was also quite a bit, it's quite quite heartbreaking. So yeah, I'm definitely curious about checking out the rest of her work after having read this. And finally, the last book that I would like to talk about and recommend from having read in 2019 is My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendrix. So again, this is another book that just has an amazing cover and amazing binding. It's basically designed like a, a yearbook. So you've got like your yearbook things on the end pages, which is super cute. And all of the like write-ups on these end pages are written from like characters within the book. So My Best Friend's Exorcism is like a campy, funny horror comedy. And I'm pretty sure Grady Hendrix has like cornered the market on horror comedy. That seems to be his, his forte. So My Best Friend Friends Exorcism is set in 1988 South Carolina and it's following two best friends Abby and Gretchen in the 80s. So it's like tons of like 80s campy tropes going on in here. It's from Abby's point of view and Abby and Gretchen are best friends. They've been BFFs since they were kids and now they are in high school. One night they're out and about uh, living on the town, living in their living their teen life, and something happens to Gretchen. And after this thing happens to Gretchen, Gretchen just isn't quite the same. Her personality starts to change. She starts to get a little bit meaner. There is like tension in their friendship, and Abby is like hell-bent on figuring out what's going on with Gretchen and eventually Abby begins to suspect that Gretchen might be possessed by a demon. So this while there is some spooky things that happen in this book and there is some like imagine like possession horror that goes on in here this is like ultimately a book about friendship and like love. This I'm not kidding when I tell you this book made me ugly cry. Like I sobbed reading this book. It's because it's about two friends and it's about love and power in friendship and like overcoming possession through the love of friendship. This book is amazing. 
it made me want to give it to all of my friends. I love this book. Highly recommend My Best Friend's Exorcism or anything by Grady Hendrix if you want something that's like horror light. He's definitely an accessible horror. Like if you're like, I'm kind of interested in horror, but I don't want to be spooked right the hell out, definitely read his because there's always um, an undercurrent of uh, comedy and satire and camp in his work. So Grady Hendrix is definitely an accessible writer, horror writer, My Best Friend's Exorcism. It is funny, it is heartwarming, spooky, possession, crying. So there you have it. That was the best uh, 13 books that I read in 2019. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you've come out of this with a new recommendation. Please let me know what you really loved and enjoyed in 2019. I would love to hear some recommendations for you. Again, thanks again for watching this and um, until next time. See you later, pals.